Hi there, and welcome to Inside the Studio. I'm Evan Sanford. Thanks so much for tuning in today. We've got a great program for you. My very special guest today is the 11th and current president of the University of Redlands, Ralph Kunsel. President Kunsel, it's an honor and privilege to have you here. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much. So, you completed your undergraduate at Occidental, a pretty big rival to the University of Redlands. Uh, have you ever had an awkward moment where you find yourself caught between supporting Occidental and mm. Redlands? Not really. It's, um, I totally transformed my loyalties when I came to Redlands, um, much to the chagrin of Occidental College and their development department. And, um, but it was, it was easy. Uh, you have been consistently open with the university community about your battle with cancer, uh, which is extremely unique about you and, and something that the student body sincerely appreciates. So first, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. As far as anyone can tell, I'm cancer free. That's fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you, but uh, don't be too quick with the congratulations because anyone who's ever had cancer knows that they're really under surveillance the rest of their lives. You never get that thought out of your mind, even if decades have passed. So that's just, just the way it is. So how has cancer affected your life? It pretty much transformed my way of thinking. Uh, what experiences were most important to me, uh, it has a way of sharpening one's focus on their own longevity and uh, the, the members of their family that, that uh, are most supportive and most valuable to them. And, um, you know, it's, it's maybe it's a hackneyed phrase to say it, it makes you think about the meaning of life. Uh, I think it, it, for me, sharpened the idea about what kind of a man I could become after that challenge. And so, the great freeing thought that was given to me was that I was in a process of becoming rather than going through a crisis. I was in the process of becoming the person I would be. And I've used that analogy to good effect. I think in many ways the university is an allegory for that. The university is becoming the kind of university it can be, which means even better than it was before. Why do you think it's so important to be open as you are with the student body about where you are in your life and with this battle? Why, why do you think it was so important to let everyone know where you were in that process? As a very practical matter, you can't remember how many lies you've told to which person. It, you can't have a hundred different stories. So if you have one story to tell and everybody hears the same story, you call that transparency. But actually, it's just a practical way to be in the world. And uh, I also wanted to teach our university community something in the process of this challenge. Why else am I going through it if I can't learn from it and help others learn from it? So I've used this phrase over and over again because it was given to me by one of our uh, trustees who quoted to me a passage that is biblical, and it goes something like this. I'm paraphrasing. It says, what's the purpose of suffering? Without suffering, there can be no perseverance. And without perseverance, there is no character. And without character, there's no hope. And so you begin with what seems like suffering or a challenge, and you end with hopefulness. And if you work your way backwards, how, how does a person or a university become hopeful about the future? Well, the first predicate is character. And the predicate before that is perseverance. And these are life lessons that I learned through the help of a friend and I believe are true to this moment. Do you think it has helped you carry out your duties better as president of the university? Hmm. It's, it's an experiment I can't, I can't do. I can't go backwards and say, what, how good would I have been or how good would the university have been if this had never happened to me? So it is what it is. It's, um, it's something that has determined how I work for a few weeks every six months. 
because I've really had four major surgeries in two years, and, and each one of those required a recovery period. I'll give you an example of one way in which I believe it has definitely helped the university for me to have been ill and laid up for a while. And that is it forced my cabinet of senior leaders to step up to the game and be far more independent and responsible self-actuated, responsible for their own actions in a way they never felt they had to before. They had to replace me, in effect, for a period of time. And they did it seamlessly at a very high level of functioning. And to me, that is the greatest proof that I chose the right cabinet. I choose people of character. And they had to prove it because I forced that on them. Yet they did, and they're so much the better for it. Now, the 27-2018 academic year will be your sixth as president, right? I came in 2012. All so, right. So, so right now then, I'm finishing five, and then the coming okay. year will be my sixth. Okay. So looking back, what have been some memorable moments for you? Oh, by far the most memorable moment was February 20th, uh, 2013. It was the day I was inaugurated. I'd been here about six months and um, turned out to be the most gorgeous Southern California day, crisp chilly in the morning. We were all processing down the quad to the chapel. And in the future in front of us was snow-capped mountains and a blue sky day and it had been raining the day before, so it was crisp, perfect air, perfect scene. It was the postcard that everyone remembers from the university. That was my coming into my own in the university's history. And the, what was remarkable about that day was that I knew that I would take some sort of an oath of office, and I knew I would give a speech, and I knew I'd ask people to do performing lots of music because I love music so much. And I'd asked one member of the faculty to represent the faculty and speak on their behalf. And uh, the story everybody knows, if they've seen the inauguration tape, or if they were there, was that Art Svensson, the person I asked to speak for five minutes, almost told me no. I asked him three months ahead of time, and he said, Ralph, you don't know what you're asking me to do. I will do nothing except worry about this and think about it constantly for three months. And I said, Art, you only have to do five to eight minutes. He says, you don't know what you're asking me to do. And he got up there having developed this private moment. It was lyrical. It was a rap. It was a riff. It, he sang a song, a parody on the old 60s, 70s song, The Witch Doctor. And it was, it was an allegorical treatment of the fact that I was a physician, an unusual candidate to come and be a president of this place. And the oath of office, I could not tell you anything about that, the formality of the day. I only know that in the middle of Art's speech, which brought the house down, his full force of personality, he looked over at me in the eyes, just like I'm looking at you, and said, Doc, take care of our house. So those five words, take care of our house, changed the branding of the university. We now use the phrase our house. And I think of that as the moment in which I was challenged to not screw it up, to take care. And of course the word care means a great deal to me as a, in my profession. But it's care of this house, our house. It was very personalized and deep in its allegorical meaning, and I'll never forget it. And of course, neither will Art. Well, isn't it such a coincidence that some alumni from our university go on to create, where everybody knows your name, the right. famous television series, and, and of course the theme song that goes along with it. It was that exact same feeling. It was personal, name recognition, uh, a complete matching of purposes in that one moment 
surrounded by lots of speeching and uh, speechifying and and music and words and pomp and ceremony and all those kinds of things but uh, the rest of it pales in comparison to that charge to me and I think that made me a much better president well is there a particular student or a professor that you've worked with since then that has particularly impressed you well there would be only one student that stands out as the person that I've had the most face time with the most contact and that would be you <laughs> I didn't so, that was not on purpose I did so not plan I'm, this <laughs> I'm not going to be able to talk about you um, so I can't say what a great friend you are or how personally I know you or how meaningful you've affected my life I can't talk about that I can't talk about what an entrepreneur you are and what a leader you are. And now not having talked about that for a period of time, I'll move to somebody else to make you feel more comfortable. Thank you. Um, the first, uh, first donation that my wife Nancy and I gave to the university was to establish a, uh, a named scholarship fund. And we fund a different student each year. In the first year, that student was Maunica Parimi and by happenstance she just came back after graduating two years ago she just came back and met with me yesterday she was a triple threat quadruple threat I'm not sure how you count it but she was a uh, she thought then a pre-medical student she's since gone on to a career in international public health she was a scientist. She was a leader in many different groups on campus. And she was a wonderful lyrical soprano. She sang in, in uh, chapel singers. And I got to sing in the chorus with her when we, took, when we went as a large group to Carnegie Hall and sang uh, Mozart Requiem. So I feel this kinship with her as a musician and um, as a future medical scientist and she's just such a sweet and talented person I made a little tiny impact on her life uh, she made a huge impact on mine and I have this feeling about the students that I've mentored and the ones I've gotten to know closest and I include you in this that once a friend friend for life I never give up friends. Um, I can tell you that the first person I had stand up in the room at my inauguration was a man who I first met when he and I walked off to our first day of kindergarten. And we've been friends for life. And I would imagine that's the kind of relationship I'm going to have with Monica Parimi and you, assuming we stay connected. I don't know what that connection is going to look like in 20 years. It's probably not going to be Facebook. <laughs> I would hope not. I hope it's more. It's not going to be Instagram. It's not going to be text messaging. It's going to be some future multimedia device that it, we can't even dream about. But we'll stay connected because the person-to-person -person aspect is what counts more than anything else. Well, thank you very much. And we'll be right back with more Inside the Studio right after this. Stay tuned. Inside the studio, I'm Evan Sanford. I'm here with the president of the University of Redlands, Ralph Kunsel. And along with the class of 2017, I'll be graduating soon. How do you think a liberal arts university like this one prepares its students for its future? Well, in the sense that we don't really get to make a class. Um, the university doesn't get to produce students. It, I really don't like that consumer model of uh, students as output or products. And that's largely because a class self-assembles, makes what it can be of itself. 
and the same is true of individuals. Uh, I called you an entrepreneur before. You're a self-made individual. You've made of your career here what you could. And almost everybody who walks away with a great sense of satisfaction. Uh, the, the surveys we've done of, of alumni say 92% of people are highly satisfied with their career here. So, but you make of it what you will. And that's the beauty of this place. It's partly the effect of the quality of one's peers. Peers make for, got to be at least half of your educational experience. And then, of course, you know, professors are here, here to help guide, um, occasionally critique and often support, but they're not packing knowledge into your head or character into your heart. They're being role models, and um, you, that means you're required to make the most of it you can. I, th I think that's, it's, it's more like, um, it's like the, the science of nutrition. We know that people will automatically develop a nutritious diet if given enough abundance of the right kinds of foods. Not a particular kind of food, abundance. And I think the same is true of a college education. Given enough abundance of options, you will, I guarantee it, create a great education one of breadth. We call it liberal arts. I prefer to call it breadth, liberating education. And uh, it, it's sort of automatic. Now, not every student gets a chance to get to know their president of the, the president of their university as much as I have. I've been extremely lucky. But for those students that don't get to, to meet you and get to know you personally, what would you want them to know about you? Well, you know, I do invite almost every student in into relationship with me if they choose to. Uh, when, it, when students are admitted here and they come for admitted student stay, I promise them at the end of my speech that if you want to know me, there's a 100% chance that you will. Uh, and when I go visit, a, say, the biology majors to talk about um, my advice for their careers in, in health sciences, uh, I say, all eight of you, come to my office, I, I'll be glad to meet with you. And not only because it's of some benefit to you, it's of great benefit to me. This is what centers my whole life and often makes my day, is the chance to meet a student. Now, unfortunately, only about one in 80 take me up on that. But every year I have a 10 or 12 students who become close in relationship. I get to know very well. I can tell stories about them. Uh, but what they may not know about me, because it's sort of scary to come up to the third floor of the administration building and meet somebody with a title that sounds maybe off-putting. What they don't know about me is that I'm really just a pretty simple, regular guy. My background is that I'm a first-generation college student. So my parents never imagined or ever talked about going to college. It wasn't something they had in their experience. They didn't know anything about it. Uh, my father was a lifelong groceryman. Uh, my mother was a stay-at-home mom until she worked in a clerical job later in life. I learned about college from my high school English teacher, who was a champion of me and absolutely predetermined that I would go to college and uh, help me do that. So I, I come from very humble beginnings, and that has a way of grounding me in what it means to have a college experience and what it means to, to try out this experiment of college when you're 17 years old and you really don't have a clue, either because you're just not you're just barely beginning to develop who you will become, and also because you, it's not part of your experience. So I, I very much s sympathize, empathize with first year, uh, first generation college students. Um, we're the same. That really must have an impact when you're on recruiting trips 
to high schools and things like that because you can really relate to their experience. Absolutely, and that's why we've, we've emphasized so much this pathway development in our strategic plan called North Star 2020. Uh, it talks about pathways a lot, and, and that's sort of jargon, but what the pathway means is that it's terribly unknowable when you're 15 or 16 to figure out what a pathway to college looks like and what a pathway through college looks like. And most of us are not so goal-oriented and linear about life planning that we, we can begin to know that. So what we've chosen to do is to become partners with regional school districts. Uh, first it was Chafee School District and then Ukaipa Unified and then Redlands Unified School District. So they're three very big surrounding us and of course we, we do recruit a lot of students locally but not nearly enough because most students don't think that we are affordable and they even though we're in their backyards they just edit us out and we will by placing guides on their campus faculty and um, en enrollment advisors we will help them find the right path for them to get to the University of Redlands. And that's true whether the path might meander through a community college and then back to Redlands or a place like Redlands because a person can waste a lot of time by taking the kinds of courses that will never help transfer and become credits for them back here at Redlands. And, and they may end up graduating in six or seven years just because they took the wrong meandering path. We're trying to develop a pathway that is secure and guaranteed. So if people do what they need to do, uh, we will guarantee admission from those high schools to the University of Redlands. We'll guarantee a very substantial scholarship grant and uh, we'll guarantee that they graduate in four years if they follow this prescribed pathway. And those are guarantees that never existed in my day and are pretty rare now. Over the course of the 2016 election, you tried to help ease international and undocumented students' minds with some memos that you sent out. As president, are there any actions you're prepared to take in order to guarantee a safe learning environment for all students? Well, the, the, these are just curious and anxiety-provoking times for um, more than anyone else, more, more so for international students and especially undocumented students. There's almost nothing we can do to predict the future. And I'll take as my example the, uh, the DREAMER Act called DACA. Um, DACA allows undocumented students to get a work permit to work in this country for two years and to um, get an ID and to be protected from deportation for two years. In order to get that, one has to jump through a lot of hoops and fill out a lot of forms and provide information. And providing information about oneself, if they are undocumented, is a risk. And now we're at this inflection point in history where that good deed done by the federal government is threatened. And we have, just to put scale on it, we have at this university probably uh, two dozen or so undergraduates in the college who are undocumented. We probably have another several dozen in the graduate and professional schools, undocumented people. Now, at the moment, the new federal administration is not granting any, as in zero, renewals of DACA status. And so people who have just expired in their status or would like to renew, we must offer them some advice and we're prepared to give them uh, uh, either free or subvened legal advice to provide them with the right resources, maybe outside uh, information resources, to provide them with moral support and real-time and advising support inside uh, in multiple offices. And we're pre prepared to go to bat for them if they choose to take the risk of renewing their status. It's a very important thing to American higher education. It's not just our little thing here. There are 800,000 
people registered under the DACA. So these undocumented people of great value to our economy. 300,000 of those are currently in colleges and universities in America. That's a huge number. It really matters to American higher education. They provide diversity and in intellectual thought diversity, uh, different origins and their background, different life stories, and, and they're very important to your education and every student's education because they create a tapestry of differences. Uh, so I'm willing to fight for that if need be. Now we, we've made pledges to everyone, our alumni and our trustees and, and um, government, that we will be law-abiding as a university. We will do what we have to do, but we will not do what we don't have to do. We won't provide information where it's not required and we will never out students. Um, we will, of course, um, comply with a properly served subpoena, uh, but we won't uh, do what we are not required to do. But we will offer the support to undocumented students as we have in the past. We accept them, we provide financial aid, and that's very important because none of them can qualify for federal loans because they're undocumented. And the DACA status does not allow them either to apply for loans. And they can't apply for private loans either because they'd have to have a cosigner. So uh, uh, this is very important to us. It's an area of our ability to relieve some, not all, of the anxiety associated with that status. And then there are international students who were threatened not to be allowed to travel to certain countries on a list. Fortunately, that was reversed, and currently uh, they are free to travel, but being free to travel doesn't mean that you're free of fear. And many of our international students and international faculty are afraid to travel to their home countries, uh, unable to have their relatives come visit them from their home, com home countries. And, and these anxieties I cannot begin to allay except I did try to offer words of support. And just sometimes in life, you find you can't do anything. I spent a career as a physician taking care of people with Lou Gehrig's disease. And uh, all of them were going to die. And I could have adopted the attitude that I couldn't do anything. It was hopeless. But instead, I adopted an opposite attitude. I was not helpless. I could always provide some help, no matter what situation that patient was in. Well, here, it's not hopeless. Even though zero DACA students are being re-upped, um, I can offer moral support and financial and, and legal support. And uh, I can assure them to the extent I can that I'm there for them. And I'm on their side. And I will sign pledges to lobby for the reinstitution of the DACA. And, and we're doing all we can. And that's why I, I and made those announcements that I did to the public. I was speaking not just to the students, uh, not just to international faculty, but I was speaking to all alumni and to our board of trustees. And I was claiming that we have principles that are stakes in the ground that we believe. And on the basis of those principles, of intellectual diversity and global approaches to learning. That's what universities are all about, and that's the principle upon which I made those pledges. Well, this has been an honor and a privilege and a four-year dream of mine. Thank you so much for being here. I Thank really you. Thank sincerely you for having appreciate me, it. I really it's do. wonderful to be here with you. And that's all the time we have for the program today. My, my special thanks to President Kunzel for being here, and thank you as well for tuning in. Until next time, I'm Evan Sanford, and this is Inside the Studio. See you soon.